Today, I'd like to talk about anxiety, climate anxiety. You can't be an environmentalist and eat meat, was one poster at this climate protest. You can't be an environmentalist and take planes, was another poster. So these posters made me take a step back and wonder if, am I a hypocrite? You see, although I don't use the term often, I'm kind of sort of an environmentalist. I work for an organization called Project Drawdown, which measures, maps, and models the most substantive solutions to climate change. With Drawdown being the point in time where greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere peak and start to decline on a year-to-year -year basis, Project Drawdown wants to answer the question, is Drawdown possible? Well, here's a hint, it is. And is it possible with existing know-how? But see, the thing about know-how is that it includes behavior. And here was I, part of this global coalition of highly qualified researchers, scientists, decision makers, and policy makers, business leaders, trying to research and promote the most substantive solutions that are robust, that are implementable, and I was eating meat, taking my gasoline car alone, and of course, flying around the world. So I tried to reason that, well, you know, I'm a small cog in this global machine, right? I mean, the planes are going to fly anyway. Researchers are going to fly around the world to conferences anyway. In fact, right now, there are several thousand of them in Madrid for the UN Climate Change Conference. So, because I live on an island, Trinidad and Tobago, I figured, you know, I'll need to fly at some point. So I tried to not think about it, you know, and focus myself and my energies on doing the most high-quality research I could in transportation systems and the built environment, and communicating it to the public as best as I could so that others could take action. I do work on the built environment, particularly for transportation systems. Transportation emissions have grown more rapidly than almost every other sector anywhere. In fact, in the U.S., if the U.S. transportation sector were compared to entire countries, it would be the fifth largest emitter on the planet. So it's quite a challenge. So there are a lot of solutions to this. In fact, at Drawdown, we're focused on the top solutions that we can find, which have the best data available, their scaling, and we came up with about 80 solutions that we could actually model these are high-quality Excel-based models. They're meta-analysis-based. We use sources such as the International Energy Agency. We look at the U.S. Energy Information Administration and, of course, MIT. And the message that comes out there is that it's quite overwhelming. With so many solutions, it's very challenging to figure out a way to communicate how many solutions that you can use in your daily life. So we try to find ways to simplify these to make it easier for you to find ways to incorporate it day to day. So I'd like to share with you one example of that today. I call it the three hours of flying. Reduce, replace, repair. So the first hour of flying is reduce, as in reduce your need for long distance travel in the first place. Now long distance travel represents between two and 5% of trips worldwide, but they represent between 40 and 50% of all distance traveled. So it's quite significant. The best way to reduce your aviation emissions was quite simply not traveling. All right? And for most people, this is you know, telepresence, as we saw today, that is uh, video conferencing, maybe with the cell phone in your pocket. So that's the most impactful way of reducing aviation emissions. Project Drawdown found that in a world focused on achieving drawdown, over a generation, replacing aviation with telepresence can see a 7 billion ton carbon dioxide equivalent reduction. That's equivalent to both the US and Mexico generating no emissions for an entire year. Now, the second hour of flying is replace, as in replace aviation with other modes of transportation. Now, aviation is one of the most high-impact or high-energy ways you can travel. It produces or generates one out of every 40 tons of carbon dioxide generated per year. 
What's more, because planes are emitting at very high altitudes, 35,000 feet typically, you're looking at some chemical reactions which amplify the emissions impact. So for instance, the nitrous oxides that are released cause ozone which amplify warming. As planes are flying at high altitudes, they generate contrails, those cloud streaks you see in the sky, which again amplify warming. So overall, it's quite significant. But what's more, as aircraft are ascending, you know, during that climb phase, they're using a lot of fuel to go through the denser atmosphere at the lower levels. So a lot of fuel is burned for short haul flights, you know, up to 500 miles or so, as they're ascending, which is why it's important that short haul flights are replaced, because they are more energy intensive per mile than long haul flights. Luckily, there are a lot of options for replacing short haul flights. So certainly, cars, for instance. But you see, a car is a very heavy machine. One car is typically well over a ton. So a lot of that fuel that you're burning is just to move the car, not the person. That's why it's important for us to carpool as often as possible. Also, you have other options. You know, you have high-quality trains, high-quality buses. In Sweden, for instance, there was a campaign that's still going on today called Flight Shame, where the idea is to encourage air travelers to switch to alternative modes of transportation, certainly trains. Further Drodong found that switching from aircraft travel to high-quality trains, high-speed rail particularly, can see a reduction of 3 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent over a generation. That's equivalent to adding India to that. So India generating no emissions for an entire year. Now the third hour of flying is repair, as in repair the damage that you're flying has caused on the climate. This is mainly using aviation offsets. So you can think of offsets as the cleanup crew that comes after the oil spill caused by your flight, right? The idea here is that you would pay an additional amount to some organization or some project that would invest in a clean energy project or a tree planting project on your behalf, right? And over time, the emissions that are reduced from that project more or less match the emissions you've generated from your flight. Now, there are a lot of criticisms of aviation offsets. How do you know that that tree you just helped to plant wouldn't have been planted anyway? How do you know it's going to stay there for 50 years, 100 years? Anything can happen in that time. Which is why it's important to, one, always ask yourself, where do you need to take that flight? After all, prevention is better than cure. And two, when you're using aviation offsets, always use internationally verified organizations. But you know, in all this research, one thing has been very clear to me. Knowing is only half the battle. Because you see, Project Drawdown focuses on existing solutions to climate change, existing solutions to global warming. So we all know that these things have to happen. These are scaling somewhere in the world. These are happening. We all know what needs to be done, but yet we don't do it. So are we waiting for others to take action on our behalf? Was I making excuses for my carbon footprint? What makes this anxiety about the climate more intense is that it's just so easy to pollute, right? It's so easy to take that flight to go anywhere in the world. It's so easy to eat the meat. It's so easy to drive alone. What we really need are systems that make it easier for us to take the drawdown solution. But we're just not there yet. So until we get to that point, we need to take action. And personally, my epiphany was realizing that Conscious action kills anxiety. So action diminishes shame. So I've finally taken action, finally here. So I no longer eat meat, red meat in particular, right? And I love red meat, love it, but because red meat has one of the highest carbon intensity of any food known to man, you know, I've cut it out. I do still eat chicken, however, I do and I'm experimenting with vegetarian meals, right? So I like to think of myself as an aspiring vegetarian, right? I take a lot of calls now, a lot of meetings virtually, right? And I love planes. I mean, I have an aerospace engineering degree from MIT, right? But I do take some flights still. That's why I'm here today. 
and I offset those flights as far as I can. The first time I told a friend that I was offsetting flights, he said, that's cheating, Mr. Environmentalist. But it's not a perfect system. But since we, I live on an island, there are very few options for getting access to islands, as most island dwellers will tell you. So there are a lot of options that I've changed here. And it might have been easier for me to not come tonight and not be here, but I realized that perhaps you may be able to be inspired to change some of your behaviors and your emissions. Now, I know what you're going to say. Why the Lord, my option, my one choice is not going to change anything. The planes are still going to fly, and everybody else is still going to do what they do. Now, this is true in isolation. However, in groups, we absolutely do have impact. Behavior change is one of the key aspects of all climate change solutions. In fact, what we found, the rare center, actually, the rare center for behavior and the environment, they found that more than 36% of the climate impact that we're needing is caused by behavior from individuals, homes, you know, households, and communities. So clearly there's impact there. So let's go back to Sweden. Because of this flight shaming campaign, there's a huge reduction in flight demand. And that has resulted in action that's needed by the airline there, as well as the Stockholm airport operator. They've had to respond with clean energy projects or accelerate projects they had in the pipeline. So clearly, individual action led to action of decision makers. So never forget that your action matters. You do have impact. Now, the climate crisis has grown to unprecedented levels. Every day it seems we're getting some new storm, some new message about flooding, some new damage somewhere in the world, but we don't have to feel powerless in this. There are actions that we can take. We don't need to wait for the decision makers, although we should lobby them. We don't need to wait for future technologies, no matter how exciting they seem. There are actions we can take today that contribute to the solution. So, for instance, do you already know what your carbon footprint is? Have you taken steps this year to reduce it? Have you shared knowledge with others to help to multiply the impact of your actions? There's so much left to be done, there's no time to waste. It's my hope that the three hours of flying will help you make easier options that are going to help you reduce your footprint and even apply them to other modes of transportation. So I'd like to end with two quotes from the revolutionary philosopher Franz Fanon. Every generation must, through relative obscurity, discover its mission and fulfill it or betray it. What matters is not to know the world, but to change it. Thank you.